So Blue Origin and Boeing are going to build an orbital reef space station. It's like a co-working space up in low earth orbit where people can do science experiments and manufacturing or just pay Jeff Bezos a ton of money to kick it in space for a bit. They were pretty vague in the presentation about what exactly people would do up there. I mean, it is Blue Origin, they kind of have to deal in vagaries because none of the technology they advertise actually exists. And in the case of Boeing, their Starliner is real, but is currently broken. Though neither company has let that stop them from announcing that they would build a whole ass space station together. But the really exciting thing that's going on here is not the orbital reef itself. It's a great idea and a neat looking space station. What's really exciting to think about is the possibility for a new frontier of research and development in space or in a microgravity environment to be more specific. This opens up fields like bioengineering, 3D printing, and manufacturing of high-tech infrastructure like fiber optics and sustainable energy. Let's talk about the real reasons that we need to take industry into space that go beyond just stroking the egos of some mediocre aerospace company bosses. This is the space race. The first thing we have to appreciate is that space and microgravity is a separate environment with unique properties from anything that we have access to on the surface of the earth. Impossible things down here can be made possible up there. And this is very important to human society because throughout our history, economic booms are always tied to new ways of making things. Think of all the things that have become accessible thanks to advancements like automation. There's no way we could all have multiple personal computers if circuit boards were still being soldered by hand. We couldn't have electric cars without automated production lines to make the batteries for us. There would be no advanced modern medicine without supercomputers to run quadrillions of calculations every second and make new discoveries. When impossible things are made possible, we level up as a society. Easily the coolest industry that is being developed in microgravity is the field of bioprinting or engineering parts of human and biology from scratch. The long-term implications of this being a day when we can just 3D print a whole new organ. Using a person's own stem cells, we could print an exact replacement for any organ they need and transplant it with no worries about rejection or any need for immune suppressants. We're nowhere near that day yet, but we are getting started thanks to microgravity experiments. A regular 3D printer works by creating a whole bunch of two-dimensional layers that are all stacked on top of each other to create a three-dimensional object and each layer solidifies enough to support the material above it. It's a great process for making a statue of Baby Yoda or a simple machine, but it's not so great for making a liver because organs are squishy. They don't hold their own shape. We know that the human body is 70% water and water under gravity just wants to run everywhere. It does not like to hold together but water under microgravity is a completely different thing. Liquids will naturally want to hold their shape. Just look at popping water balloons in space, for example. Anyway, what we're getting at is even with the technology to print a liver on Earth, it would just collapse into a puddle before they could finish. Or imagine trying to print a lung with all of its voids and cavities inside. What could possibly support that kind of structure until it has a chance to fully form? It's impossible, but in space, this becomes possible. That's what the BFF machine is for. The biofabrication facility was launched to the International Space Station in July 2019 and has already successfully printed tissue-like constructs with a large volume of human heart cells aboard the ISS lab, as well as a human meniscus. That's the layer of cartilage in your knee that separates the large bones in your thigh and your shin and acts like a shock absorber. If you had bad knees, it's probably because this thing got damaged. Imagine if they could just print you a new one. The biggest problem with doing these experiments on the ISS is the disconnect between the researchers and their experiment. 
The way that it works is the bio inks have to be launched up to the ISS on a rocket. The flight crews conduct the experiments using remotely uploaded print files, and then they send the results back down to Earth in the next available capsule. Obviously, the research and development for this technology could move so much faster if the scientists associated with the project could be up there in space doing the experiments and seeing the results in real time. And that's something that the orbital reef could make possible. A whole module of the station just dedicated to bioprinting. There's no doubt that it would accelerate our transition to using artificially grown tissue and organs to treat human patients. There's a whole industry starting to develop for making new products in space using manufacturing processes that are again, just not possible here on earth. A great example of this is a fluoride glass material called Zeblan that in theory could be used to make the most efficient, high capacity fiber optic material in the world, but only when it's made in microgravity. When Zeblan is pulled into fiber optic wire on earth, the material is prone to crystallization during the cooling process, and these defects prevent the material from reaching its full potential. When Zeblan fiber is produced in microgravity, it comes out perfectly clear, like glass, and that's when it becomes a significantly more useful material than our standard silica glass fiber optics. The amount of signal loss that occurs in just 10 kilometers of silica fiber would only occur over 2,000 kilometers of Zeblan fiber. That means we could run trans-ocean data streams with no need to build and maintain repeater stations to signal boost under the water. This could make Zeblan valuable enough to become the first material to be manufactured in space and sold on Earth. Just a single kilogram of the fiber optic wire could be worth tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's the kind of value proposition that we need right now to actually make space-based manufacturing happen. Because it is so prohibitively expensive to get anything into orbit and back again, there needs to be an extremely high profit margin as a reward for the effort. And yet again, once the infrastructure is established permanently in a place like the orbital reef, then over time, the cost of production can start to come down and more people start to benefit from the technology. There are a couple of really cool things going on with 3D printing in space. For one, we can use traditional printing methods that we all know, but with new printing materials like ceramics, crystals, and metal super alloys. And for two, we can use 3D printing technology to launch self-manufacturing satellites into orbit. We've already been experimenting with 3D printing on the ISS for a while now, the first printer was sent up there in 2014, and they've printed over 200 items so far in space. Now those experiments are turning to how we can use stronger materials to print more useful things in microgravity. This is along the same lines as making fiber optics in space. When materials are melted and solidified in microgravity, they form with a much more homogeneous structure, meaning there are fewer defects or irregularities in the material and that translates to higher strength and lower residual stress. Currently, this is being applied to reinforced ceramics that are 3D printed into an incredibly heat resistant material that would be ideal for extreme situations like rocket engines. The next step from ceramics would be trying the same process with crystal and then eventually 3D printing metallic super alloys on a space station. How about satellites though? 3D printing has the potential to take satellite infrastructure to a whole new level. So the problem that we are stuck with right now is something that people in the industry call the tyranny of the fairing. It's a super dramatic way to say that the size of the cargo fairing on a rocket ship is a limiting factor for satellite design because the satellite has to fit into this relatively small and narrow space. The fairing size on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is 13 meters long and 5.2 meters in diameter. The Falcon Heavy allows for a longer fairing, but not wider. The SpaceX Starship will open up a much wider fairing size sometime in the future, but it doesn't exist yet. Right now, satellite engineers are getting around these narrow cargo spaces by making satellites that fold up for transport and then unfurl when they reach their destination. Take the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. This thing is absolutely gigantic 
with a sun shield the size of a tennis court. This whole thing has to fold up into the 5 meter diameter fairing of an Ariane 5 rocket. And then, when it reaches its destination, far beyond the moon, millions of kilometers from Earth, it has to unfold perfectly. If even one hinge fails on that telescope, then we've wasted $10 billion and years worth of work. So how do we avoid all of this? How about a satellite that can actually build itself in space? The first step in this new industry is called the Archonaut 1. It's a satellite designed from a company called Redwire. The technology behind Archonaut combines additive manufacturing with robotic assembly for remote in-space construction of large complex structures. They're starting simple with the manufacturing and assembling of a solar panel array. Instead of building the solar array on the ground and then folding it and launching it, Archonaut will start 3D printing the components for its own solar array in orbit and then a robotic arm will assemble and deploy the structure. With this kind of technology, even the smallest satellite can deploy 10 square meters or more of solar panel structure. And this could scale up to something the size of the ISS. Rewire believes that an Archonaut enabled system on a space station would triple the deployed surface area of the solar array, and all of this would come at a drastically reduced launch cost. And again, because we're building in space, not on Earth, we aren't constrained by forces like gravity. It's believed that we can 3D print structures in space that are up to seven kilometers in length. Imagine what seven kilometers worth of solar panels could power. Being able to work on a project like that from space in a dedicated research module on something like the orbital reef would get us much closer to sustainable energy so much faster than if we are stuck down here on Earth. So as fun and easy as it is to rag on Blue Origin and Boeing, and believe me, I love flaming Jeff Bezos, the Orbital Reef is actually a great idea that needs to get built as soon as possible. We know that Elon Musk and SpaceX are way too wrapped up in going to Mars to handle a project like this, and NASA is too busy with going back to the moon. So as much as it might pain us to say, maybe Blue and Boeing are the best companies for the job. If they can get it together and make this work, then that more than makes up for all of the embarrassing stuff they've done in the past. Like I said, I'm a little doubtful, but let us know in the comments if you think Jeff can pull this one off. Please don't forget to leave an offering to the algorithm gods and give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. We've got two more videos up there on the screen that you'd probably enjoy as well. Subscribe to this channel if you're not already for more space content and ring the little bell so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching the video today and we will see you next time.